I'm uh, happy to uh, present you our speaker tonight, but I will do it in a few minutes and show you or uh, speak a bit about the context uh, in which this lecture is taking place. Uh, I'll start or try to share a screen because I have a few images. Okay. Um, so can someone just confirm me that uh, they see my screen? Yes, yes. Perfect, thanks. So um, tonight uh, it's gonna be a lecture of a uh, British uh, artist, Laura Yule. But uh, first I wanted to mention for the audience that this lecture is organized by the Faculty of Architecture at the uh, Brno University of Technology, which uh, somehow takes over the, of the space of the Gallery of Architecture in Brno and runs the runs the program uh, this year. Uh, and um, uh, when uh, we have Laura here, we have to mention a very similar project uh, of another artist and architect, uh, which is called Private Views. Uh, which we exhibited in the gallery uh, in October and uh, uh, November. And uh, in this relation, we also invited Laura to give uh, tonight's lecture. Uh, this project of uh, Hungarian artist and architect uh, Andy Schmidt, um, uh, which was exhibited in, uh, in the gallery, and uh, is not uh, is was uh, about the finance financialization of uh, Manhattan's uh, skyscrapers, but not only them, but, but like generally of real estate. Uh, if you missed that exhibition, uh, the project was actually published in uh, and this book, uh, Private Views, uh, you can buy it. And uh, I highly recommend it, it's a really nice book. And the project is really interesting. Uh, she basically pretends to be a, a wife of a millionaire uh, going to viewings of very expensive uh, units at the Manhattan and uh, taking uh, photographs. And then uh, for the book, she uh, also asked uh, several experts and um, like uh, art geographers or sociologists or, or another art artist to write about the problem of speculation with um, real estate. Uh, I uh, also liked the, her uh, photos of the bathroom uh, because it's uh, obviously somehow important that every flat uh, has a self-standing uh, bathtub. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, another thing which I liked uh, was an uh, essay by Samuel Stein, who is an uh, American geographer. This essay was originally published in Andy Schmidt's book. Uh, it's about uh, 135 questions uh, for, to those investors or developers who are occupying the uh, New York's uh, uh, skyline. And this essay uh, was translated for the exhibition and later published at uh, the uh, news website, uh, Denik Referendum, so also the Czech audience can read it. I highly recommend it. It was also uh, published in English uh, on the Beffler uh, for the international audience. Or I just mentioned some uh, Stein book, uh, which he published on this uh, topic. Uh, I also uh, would like to invite you for our upcoming exhibition, uh, which will have an online opening and lecture uh, by its author Gabo Heindl, an Austrian architect who uh, who's currently um, research on inequalities in cities and uh, housing. Uh, the exhibition is gonna uh, is will be called uh, uh, Urban Conflicts uh, Housing Manifesto, and it uh, uh, will continuously work on um, uh, well uh, present a growing manifesto on housing. Uh, and there will be also a lot of accompanying program in forms of lecture with people from different cities all over the wor world who will participate on the manifesto. Uh, anyway, back to tonight. Um, Laura is a, a UK-based artist and researcher. Uh, her practice explores the entanglements uh, between domestic and urban space 
through matters of community, sustainability and obsolence and the effects of globalization and technological developments she has exhibited all over the world, basically. Uh, and uh, currently she she's also finishing her practice lab PhD at the Northumbria University in Newcastle on the topic or like with the title infrastructural coziness, uh, financialized housing and the performance of community. And uh, she studied fine arts and I'm happy to um, have her here tonight because she's going to present us her uh, project Asset Arrest. I don't want to uh, uh, give any spoiler uh, before the presentation, but I really liked it. Uh, and uh, it has something in common with what Andy Schmidt did, although I guess uh, they didn't know each other before. But anyway, um, I'm very much looking forward to what uh, Laura is going to tell us. Uh, Laura, uh, very much thank you that uh, you are here with us and uh, I give you the word, finish sharing the screen. So Hi. everything um, should be yours. Okay. Thank sharing you. Screen. Oh no, I pressed the wrong button. Uh, coming you can see it yes okay brilliant um okay so well yeah. we see the microsoft teams oh uh, shit. Yeah, of course perfect <laughs> thanks um perfect uh i i don't have powerpoint at the moment so it's just in this browser um but thank you so much for inviting me to speak um and I'm yeah really happy to do this in connection with Andy's show. Um, I think a friend, a very good friend of mine in in Budapest, uh, introduced me to Andy. I think, oh, COVID years uh, are hard to remember, but I guess it was about um, three years ago. And actually, just before the lockdown, I was supposed to go to Budapest, and we were going to view properties together um, in real life. But lockdown happened and we ended up uh, meeting online and doing a viewing online, which was a bit underwhelming, but um, kind of interesting, uh, given that, yeah, I, I, I suppose that was quite an unusual situation to view property in. Um, but yeah, I'm very happy to hear about anyone who is viewing property uh, to waste their time and has no interest in actually buying it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I'm an artist and researcher in London. Um, I work across a lot of different disciplines such as video, performance, writing, installation. Um, but in this talk, I'm gonna focus on my project Asset Arrest, which I have in some way or another been working on for the past five, six years, I think. <clears throat> Maybe a bit longer, like since I moved to London, I, uh, yeah, became, obsessed with the fact that half the city is kind of consumed by these like huge hoardings around building sites, all these kind of shiny idealized uh, images like photos and CGI renderings of um, spaces that are going to be finished and these kind of luxury lifestyles, um, all these happy people drinking coffee and in the gym. Um, so I just started wanting to actually get into these spaces. Um, I mean, in London anyway, there's such a huge volume of them. Obviously the same in New York where Andy was viewing property. Um, and, you know, these are spaces that are inaccessible to most people, um, despite the fact there's an ongoing housing crisis, people are being displaced and moved, move, moving further and further out the city, having to commute crazy like two hours to work and, and things like that. Um, so I started, yeah, just arranging viewings of uh, properties I was interested in. Um, and I did it for a couple of years just as research or I didn't really know what I was doing with it. Um, and then I did some as tours uh, for the public for a really great festival in London called the Anti-University Festival. Um, and members of the public could sign up and uh, 
come with me to a viewing and I would kind of make it easy. I would, you know, a lot of people are very uncomfortable, obviously, with going to view a 10 million pound house. Um, so I would do the talking and, you know, be the one that gets all the millions of phone calls afterwards, seeing if I would buy it. Um, but then I started uh, publishing it as a podcast series. Um, so each episode is a viewing of a different residential property. And I invite a different guest each time. Um, and we pretend to be potential buyers or renters in some case. Um, so I'm going to show you just, I'm just going to be scrolling through a few images of places I've been to view. Um, this is the you know, an example of the kind of hoardings that pop up with ridiculous claims. Um, and the podcast is basically, I record a conversation with my guest before we go into the viewing. And then I record one after the viewing. And I mix that with, um, in the middle, some of the kind of promotional material that the, uh, that the property developers put out or the estate agents. Um, so usually we talk about the guests' work. Um, so a lot of guests have been artists, architects, activists, academics. I've had one who was a, an estate agent and a TikTok influencer, um, or they might just be people that live in the area that the, the property development's situated in. Um, and they might, you know, some of them get in touch with me. They have an interest in, in going to see it. They want to talk about it. They have problems with it. Um, so we, yeah, we talk about their situation or work and we also respond to the areas we're in and the property we see um, and the issues that it raises. Um, this is, this is <laughs> that's actually a light box, not a window with a view, but they, they kind of set it up to project what your view will look like. I think that cost about £10 million and it's, it's a very small bedroom. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've viewed things that are in the grand ridiculous scheme of things, not that expensive as in 800,000 pounds, which to me is insanely expensive, but clearly it's not as bad as some of the other ones I've seen, which are 55 million pounds. Um, so my last episodes were coinciding as with Freeze Art Fair in London. Um, I featured a viewing of a 55 million pound mansion the owners were in it. It was all very awkward. Um, I also did one with a trip to a property fair that happened the same weekend um, where they were selling properties from Lagos and Nigeria to Florida and the US. Um, and then I went to also an event that was about the importance of placemaking for new property developments, which was focusing on kind of the benefit of uh, using artists within um essentially the branding for new property developments, which has become a huge factor in new developments in London. Um, they sometimes offer free space to arts organisations or to um, artists as studios, not free, but apparently reduced price. Um, but another strand of the project is that I still do occasional tours that members of the public can sign up to and they can come with me to attend a viewing of a property of their choice. Um, and I basically just make the process, hopefully less intimidating and more straightforward. If there's questions they wanna ask that are quite critical and strange, I guess, then I can ask them if they want. And again, I kind of deal with the, the sales calls and emails that happen for years after them. <laughs> Um, so I've taken asset rest, asset rest to Berlin, Newcastle, Guangzhou and Shenzhen and China. Um, but most of the episodes have taken place in London where I live. But I plan to keep doing it um, and, and view property whenever I end up in another country or city. So if anyone is interested in viewing property, do get in touch um, and maybe I'll end up in your city one day. Um, but I, yeah. I, I intend to continue this in the long term. It's not a kind of podcast that's out every two weeks or anything. It just happens when I have the time to do it. Um, but 
Yeah, it's really interesting for me to kind of map out how processes of financialization and gentrification are unfolding in different locations, because obviously it's it's not the same in one country to another. Um, and I have also got an extensive um, archive, I guess, of brochures, um, the developments in London. They, they produce these brochures, these books that are just... Um, insanely expensive feeling hardback kind of beautiful ridiculous um yeah i don't know they feel like luxury objects in themselves um i feel it's important to say that uh when i when i ask for a viewing for a property unless it's kind of at the insane level of price such as 20 million um, I, I just use my own name and I kind of like the idea that they can, you know, Google me or find out who I am uh, after or before the pod, uh, before the viewing. Um, and maybe they could discover the podcast and become aware of what I'm doing. Um, and the reason for that is that I feel like that takes it to a kind of another bizarre level of infiltration. Um, one big, huge property developer in London found out what I was doing because I'd published a couple of podcasts about their developments and they cancelled a viewing I was planning to do on me. Um, I, yeah, I don't think they can really stop me from viewing their property as I can obviously just make new names up and new email addresses. But I like that there was the weird potential to kind of get into dialogue with them. Um, and this project has fed into my recent PhD research. I'm just um, finishing my PhD now. Um, and I, I guess I see it as kind of situating theory and research within the actual spaces that I'm interrogating and writing about and experiencing the space through not only, you know, literature that's been written about it or what we can see from the outside, but from the marketing, the branding, the physicality, you know, the way that the estate agent talks to you, what they say in that sales pitch, um, as well as like the, the social and political and economic effects that can be determined from a distance and are usually incredibly obvious. Um, so, yeah, my, my PhD basically looks at four different kind of housing topologies, like financialized housing topologies that have emerged over, I don't know, the past couple of decades, really. Um, and they are all forms of housing that are very much reliant on a, a global network of um, investors, as well as global flows of people, uh, privileged, economically privileged people. Um, and I've been tracing the shift from homes to real estate while examining these different new tip topologies of housing. Um, and I've been interested in the way they all construct borders and form different exclusions within their locations. Um, so I've been arguing that basically each one of them is a different variation of a gated community. Um, but I'm not in, it, I've not been talking about gates as in the kind of physical gates or CCTV cameras or security guards, which are generally present, but the gates in each case consist of um, different spatial, social and political infrastructure um, and, and generally work together to produce kind of homogenized spaces um, of exclusion and of sameness. Um, so I'm talking about real and imaginary gates. Um, so it might be, for example, the commodification of community as, a, as an idea. It might be an architecture of convenience or an architecture of somewhere else, elsewhere. Uh, it might be a network of international investment that tends to facilitate the construction of these buildings. Or it might be, and usually is also, an othering of the area's wider commu community or like a lack of investment in the wider community. Um, and yeah, so gated communities, I think, create pockets of exclusion and they attempt to reject the, the very locality they're situated in. Um, they definitely embody a wealth driven and growth orientated um, idea of consumption. And they kind of 
promote themselves as as a as a kind of members club that people can buy into and the members you know that's what's pitched as community um so they enable particular relationships and aspirations within them but they i would say re really aggressively exclude others and i'm not just talking about the kind of luxury housing that's pitched to investors to buy um so i just want to kind of briefly introduce a couple of the uh, housing case studies that I talk about in my PhD. Sorry, I've realized I've not really gone through the images here. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is the new development is called Am Tacheles, um, which is in Berlin. Um, some, I mean, people might know this building. It's very famous. After the fall of the wall, a group of artists squatted this former department store and they called it Tachelis, which means straight talking in Yiddish. Um, it's very well known. It was a squat. Um, once the artists move in in 1990, they launched a legal battle and rescued the building from demolition um, by getting it listed as having an A-list heritage status. Uh, they then prepared you know, they did some work in the building and they changed it into something that would be open to a wider community. Uh, there was exhibition and event spaces, a bar or multiple bars, a cafe, workshops, um, a small cinema and artist studios. So they kind of professionalized it. Um, and then in the mid 1990s, the government sold it to a developer um, who negotiated with the artists and gave them a 10 year lease. Um, for a nominal, barely existent rent. Um, so this kind of legalized the situation. Um, the contract ended in 2009. And then after that, the, you know, the artists living there basically became squatters again. Um, but in 2011, uh, an, an eviction notice was served. Um, a lot of the artists moved out. There was a compensatory payment of 1 million euros. Um, but about 40 to 60 of them stayed and they stayed there till 2014 when the building was sold to a New York based uh, development company. Um, it had at one point, it was the second most visited art attraction in Berlin. Um, and basically the work that the artists put into this building for, uh, I don't know, what was it like 20 years, 22 years? Um, basically paved the way for the development it's now becoming, which is Am um, um, So this is a kind of textbook luxury development um, on the site of the old building, but also incorporating the old building. The, the X squat is going to become a fairly commercial photography gallery. Uh, they started construction on this in 2019 and it's scheduled to be completed in 2023. Um, I think prices start at about near 1 million, uh, but many are, you know, reaching the kind of 2 to 4 million mark. Um, so this is, you know, it's not surprising. It's a very familiar process of gentrification. Um, and I think we can basically consider that the, the former artist squatter residents basically not through their intention, but they um, ended up somehow acting as grassroots developers. Um, so basically all the time, effort and energy they invested into this building was eventually appropriated um, by a mixture of the state kind of deciding to sell it off, I guess, but also mostly through international real estate companies. Um, so eventually, of course, it displaced not only the artists, but a much wider community. Um, that is the other side of the old facade, um, where they've kind of reimagined what the facade would be these days. Um, and they have all kinds of uh, ridiculous claims on their website, which I'm going to just go through quickly, but you can find it on their website. Um, so this is the entrance to the building. The graffiti is obviously from its previous life, life as, a, as an art center and squat. But as you can see, they have the Amtachelis sign there. Um, so they've kind of kept uh, this 
the remnants of its previous life. Um, I like to think of it as a kind of urban taxidermy. Um, so they've kind of like presenting these sections of the wall as disconnected from their original context um, and obviously appropriated by the developers towards selling property. Um, so obviously it feels like a, a very kind of cynical, ironic move, um, a luxury residential development retaining features of its former self, which was a squat. Um, it, yeah, there's no denying that it feels quite uncomfortable. Um, so they've kind of, the developers approached it as a kind of cultural pick and mix in which they can select certain elements of it for marketing. Um, they said they discovered, discovered that there was a Banksy graffiti there, um, which they've decided to keep, obviously. An art collector tried to buy it for 1.5 million, they told me, um, but they decided not to sell it. And instead, they are building some kind of chapel around it. So it's, you know, the intention is that becomes a bit of a tourist attraction itself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's very different from the feelings of uh, those who squatted the building, um, who speak about basically finding this space that appeared to be dead, um, but they brought it back to life through acts of mending and maintenance and repair, um, creating new infrastructure there. It became a kind of fluid space that could change when the residents' needs changed. Um, so, yeah, it was very open and fluid as a lot of kind of like professional squats are, I guess, if we're going to call them that. Um, this is like, yeah, this is also an image of the kind of new Tacula's, um marketing suite. Um, they produced, the developers made a publication right at the start of the project to kind of set the scene and plant an idea in people's minds. Um, it was called After Now, which responded to a, a kind of huge graffiti um, that was on the side of the wall of the building. Um, they described Berlin as a paradox knotted in a time warp with a past, present and future so dense, so complex and yet open for explanation, uh, exploration. They described Berlin as a place that's continually in the making. Um, they describe it as open and unfinished, um, as in some parts neglected and degraded. Um, but they also talk about Tachelis, the new Tachelis, Am Tachelis, as, um, yeah, as a space that's going to continue that kind of creative energy, but also as a space that's finally going to be finished. Um, so the book kind of has a lot of interviews of people who have businesses in the area, like expensive designer clothes, people who sell smoothies and coffees. Um, so they they pay this lip service to the the kind of experimental ways of living that the artists had um, engaged with, but they basically paint it as a situation where the artists have achieved what their obvious goal was anyway, which was getting the place renovated and, you know, making it commercially abundant. Um, these are, I don't know, just some fancy people who have been photographed in the in the entrance to the new sales and marketing suite. I don't know who they are, sadly, but um, they look like fancy celebrities. That was it before, before it became a sales and marketing suite. Um, and then my thesis basically, as well as kind of thinking about different ways that these housing case studies or topologies construct different gates, um, gates that are some real, some imagined, psychological, various different forms of gates. Um, I'm thinking about projects that enact what we might call ungating. Um, so in, in, in kind of to contrast against Amtachelis, I have been looking at the house terror statistic in Berlin. Again, people might know of this. It's, it's very well known. It's been write, written about a lot at the moment. Um, so I'm interested in how this development basically redirected a vacant building towards being um, removed from the speculative real estate market. 
Uh, it used to be, I think it was built around 1970. It housed the the German, the GDR's state central administration for statistics, and then it was sitting empty since 2008. Um, but in during Berlin Art Week in 2015, a group of uh, four artists kind of arrived there in the morning and dressed in high-vis vests and hard hats, they erected a spider lift um, and two of them went up in this caged platform to, I don't know, maybe the seventh floor or something. And the other two artists broke in and went up the stairs and basically they, hang, they hung a kind of huge vinyl banner on the facade of the building. Um, that looked a lot like the banners you get on construction sites in the city. Um, so the banner translated to English read roughly under development here for Berlin, space for culture of, cultural affairs, education and so, social projects. And then they had, they held a kind of pseudo launch event where they invited press and friends and supporters and, you know, more people started coming because there was a crowd um and basically this kind of very short intervention um led to them having a meeting with the mayor of Mitte um about like making it a reality um and while the mayor kind of met it with a bit of skepticism they agreed on a second meeting and in between the two meetings, the artists and many others worked together to kind of come up with a proposal that was actually feasible. They got a bank to agree that they could front a loan, things like that. Um, so eventually it, it worked and the Berlin Senate bought the building to turn it into, you know, something beneficial for the community around it, for refugees, for artists. Um, so now the building is going to become workspace for artists and cultural organizations and small businesses, also space for education, it's going to house the local administration offices, but more importantly, it's going to have um, housing for refugees, I think about th a thousand refugees they want to have there, and also um, social housing, long term social housing, I'm not entirely sure the details of you know, what that social housing means in cost terms. But um, basically they want to see about 2000 people living and working in the building when it's complete, which will be, I think in about six years. Um, so the project is very much shaped by conversations between not only the state, not only, you know, certain real estate companies that are involved, but also between the artists and activists who initiated the whole process. And this is a, a kind of like information hub they've set up at the moment. So basically any members of the public can drop in, people can get involved in the planning process. It's very open. Um, so basically I'm thinking about this as an example of ungating, of kind of like seizing a building from the real estate uh, market and turning it into something else. And I do think this is a very, very unusual example. And I struggle to imagine it ever happening in London in London. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I doubt that it would happen in London. I don't know about anywhere else, but um, somehow they made it happen. Um, yeah, that's the building with some, oh, yeah, this is the, the next housing topology I want to talk about is co-living. Um, so this is a building called The Collective, which is in Canary Wharf, London's financial district in London. Um, I mean, co-living, obviously, like communal housing arrangements have been, have a huge long history. Um, Co-housing, communes, you know, there's many different variations. Um, but this is kind of in the vein of the WeWork style uh, co-living. WeWork did have a co-living place in New York. I'm not sure if it's still there, but basically it means that people pay rent for usually a very small room or apartment and they get access to lots of different um, communal facilities. So there might be a lounge, many lounges, a shared kitchen, a gym, a swimming pool, you know, all the kind of markers of the usual new luxury living. 
Um, so this is apparently the biggest one in the world. Um, it's got 705 rooms that they call micro apartments, um, but also people can stay for as little as one night. So really, um, in reality, it's, it's also a hotel. Um, and they're basically selling community as a resi, like a ready-made product. Um, and much like we work, a network that allows the individual to find collaborators and opportunities and increase their productivity. Um, so the language they use to sell the collective, this is one of the, this is the, like the bar and restaurant on the top floor, which is also open to the public. Um, so the language they use to sell it um, from their website includes phrases like a better way of living. Our mission is to build and activate spaces that foster human connection and enable people to live more fulfilling lives. And co-living is a way of living in cities that is focused on community and convenience. Um, but obviously that, you know, really sits at odds with the fact they're a corporate landlord. Um, and on their website, we also find phrases like, uh, we, we promote, we, we'll lay, you know, you got to hustle harder, you got to, we, we will harness the power of our global following. Um, so yeah, it's that kind of startup culture where it's supposedly about community, but actually it's about networking and hustling. Um, so the the C, 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 COO, one of the, the kind of main collective guys uh, made made a kind of talk or proclamation at one point where he said, in the future, we will all be homeless. Um, so that, I think, is the most kind of like poignant um, statement about the fact that they have commodified the idea of community. And they're pretending it's about community rather than uh, rather than real estate. Um, so they kind of try and paint this idea of like the millennial who doesn't want to have kids, doesn't want to own property, privileges experience over property, uh, things like that. But they completely neglect the fact that maybe many of those people are actually living very precariously, dealing with gig work that doesn't pay well. They can't, you know, they can't afford to buy houses. Maybe they don't have kids because they can't afford to or think they can't afford to. Um, so they really kind of rebrand precarity and use that as a as a selling point. Um, but obviously, yes, they are profit driven landlords. Um, so. It's also part of this idea of living as a service um, that seems quite popular where you pay one monthly fee and um, you get, you know, your bills are included, maybe your use of a gym or a swimming pool is included, things like that. Um, I should just point out that the collective is incredibly expensive. I think a, a very, very small room um, costs about £1,500 a month. Um, I'm not sure what that is in other currencies, but basically it's a lot of money. Um, so yeah, they've monetized the idea of community. Um, they're selling community as a product. Um, and in turn, that allows them to draw attention away from the fact that the rooms, they call them micro apartments, are actually absolutely tiny. You know, you've got a a bed that's pretending to be a double bed that's actually made smaller than a normal double bed. It's right beside a kitchenette. Um, so you basically, your bed smells of whatever you're cooking and the fire alarm goes off immediately if you try and fry something. Um, and they, they basically get around normal spatial standards by converting office buildings into housing which is a thing in the UK where you basically different rules and regulations apply if you don't convert an already residential building um, or they build the building from scratch and they get around it that way. Um, they also have a membership scheme basically residents are members rather than tenants which means they're um, the contract basically the 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 members have essentially no rights. It's very much like it's it's not being a tenant of a flat where you have your landlord owes you certain things. Um, because the rooms are so small, it really also 
limits who the occupant might be. Um, so basically, it, you would struggle to live there if you were disabled, if you had children, if you had pets, even if you were a couple. Um, and the size of the room also limits you know, what you can do there. For example, if you want to host a few friends, it would be very difficult. So it's basically an infrastructure that doesn't support intimacy on any level. Um, and yeah, I'm viewing this as a form of gating because it very, very much excludes people who don't fit a very narrow and predetermined mold of inhabitant. Um, but they, you know, they very much uh, brand themselves in a very strong, colorful, confident way. They sell this idea of belonging. The branding itself, I would say, is a form of ar architecture. Um, and they even make claims of providing a solution to the housing crisis and, you know, ending urban loneliness, which is apparently a problem as well. Um, so, yeah, I think it's quite an interesting example. I stayed there for one month and I have to say I didn't enjoy it that much, but I'm just probably not the right kind of person to stay there. Um, that is the Zen room. Uh, so yeah, I'm not gonna, my thesis basically also looks at two other housing topologies, which I'm not gonna go into in detail because of time, but I'll just mention that they are purpose-built student housing, which is a, a big industry in the UK. I look at student housing in Newcastle, where I'm doing my PhD. Um, and it's basically, there's a lot of it concentrated in one small area. There's 20 blocks um, and it's all run by corporate landlords. Um, and it's basically built on investment from international investors. Um, and it's basically propelling a process called studentification, studentification which um, like gentrification has economic, social, cultural and physical effects. Um, so we see the inflation of property prices because, you know, when you turn a building into student accommodation, you can charge more. There's many international students who are maybe not aware of the general rental market. Um, there's a social dimension, which means the, the price increase causes long-standing residents to be displaced. Um, I, yeah. It, and they're replaced by young residents who maybe don't actually stay there that long, maybe one year, maybe two, maybe three. Um, we also have a lot of businesses closing because of that, maybe different businesses open to cater towards the students, but often that is quite expensive, trendy bars or it's, you know, things that actually the other non-student population don't want. Um, and the businesses that they've been, you know, going to for years or the whole life have, have been closed down as a result of this. Um, so, yeah, with studentification, we see a kind of, um, uh, yeah, a similar process to gentrification where there's social cleansing and it also kind of sets up this co-living style lifestyle. The student housing has a very similar structure with like, um, you might have a gym and a, and a lounge and co-working spaces. So there's really this kind of um, tailoring of subjectivity that's based around consumerism and individualism or entrepreneurialism. Um, so I'm interested in thinking about ways we can ungate these spaces um, and, and think about actually what the effects are on the localities that they're um, positioned within. Um, and I don't have any simple answer to that, but I think there's a few factors that for me are important, which would be the idea of the right to the city, um, also the idea of uh, the radical imagination that Max Haven and Alex Canabish has written about. Um, which involves a collective process um, where we work together to imagine the world differently rather than an individual possession. Um, and something that, as they say, 
where it represents our capacity to imagine and make common cause with the experiences of other people, something that undergrids our capacity to build solidarity across boundaries and borders, real or imagined. Um, so for me, Asset Arrest as a project is a very small effort towards ungating these spaces, as I think we should feel completely entitled to enter them. And I would love if more people just started viewing property out of interest and to ask questions um, rather than these spaces feeling like, um, you know, terrifying kind of exclusive places that we are not meant to enter. Um, and yeah, I'm going to stop there. Perfect, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I uh, I already have at least three questions which I'm dying to ask you since I got to know <laughs> the podcast, but I also want to mention that everyone can join the discussion and ask maybe best if you either turn off the turn on the camera so we somehow notice that there is someone who wants to speak if you don't want to raise a hand or something and then I um, like uh, say the name uh, so someone is like that we don't shout over each, each other but I'm really happy if anyone asks but uh, okay I ask now <laughs> uh, uh, well generally I, I really like your work and uh, actually myself also like I studied architecture and kind of an art program but I have to ask uh, you as an artist how did it happen that you became so interested in, I would say, architectural topic or even financial financialization of housing, which is, which is even more economical, political, whatever, very interdisciplinary, I would say. But I, I, I would like to know your how, like, how did it happen? Uh, what brought you to this? And what's your position on that, that you as an artist uh, kind of speak about this and maybe criticize architects or like the architecture practice or development uh, in this? <laughs> um, no one's really asked me that before, but basically, I don't know. I think somehow since I was very young on my undergraduate course at art school, I've been interested in kind of the architectural and in some shape or form. Um, I think I think a lot of it came from growing up in the suburbs of Glasgow and, and I don't know, it not feeling right. These kind of rows of monotonous pebble dash houses and I don't know. I think it maybe came from a discomfort around that and maybe the lack of community I felt there or could perceive there. I was, you know, too young to maybe really think about it that clearly. Um, but I'd say definitely like Asset Arrest and a lot of my other work um, probably came out of moving to London um, <laughs> and about seven or eight years ago and housing just feeling like such a devastating issue and something, you know, the luxury property development of something that really can't be escaped. Um, so I'd say, yeah, it definitely got more intense as a interest or topic or whatever then um I don't know and it's also just one of I mean everyone should have a home is such a basic human right and important thing and I know like making art or a podcast doesn't really do anything about it but you know it's it's part of a, a bigger conversation I hope about about these issues um, I really admire uh, your work or work of Andy that, uh, and I think it's not enough. I mean, I think, uh, as you mentioned in the end, that uh, more and more people should uh, somehow, uh, I don't know, like uh, deconstruct the real estate market or, or or like use some guerrilla actions to... Yeah, um, imagine like uh, hundreds, thousands, I don't know, lots of people doing it at once in different locations or something. I know it doesn't they don't realize that you're not interested in it therefore feels a bit futile but if I went into a property like fuck you I'm gonna destroy this place then I'd just be kicked out and that would be it so I find it more interesting to kind of take this like 
slow, subtle approach and then publish a conversation about it? Um, yeah, uh, I, I just wanted to say that, um, like, when I got to know about your podcast or the project, I was like, wow, this is great. Uh, I think we should do this also in Prague or in, like, many other <laughs> cities because it's all over and no one, like, the, at, at that time, I didn't know about similar project or or even maybe uh, news articles or something that would describe housing or real estate market as as you or then uh, similarly undid it. Uh, but I have a second question. Uh, how did it like, I, I think that uh, like, okay, uh, actually you have a very similar idea with Andy, like pretending to be someone or at least yeah. pretending uh, being interested in buying something in order to get into something and then later uh, criticized or like have a critical uh, point of view on it. And you actually chose uh, the tool or uh, a method of podcast, uh, which is uh, kind of funny because architecture is uh, by itself kind of a visual or material uh, thing. And then you decided to present it in a, only an audio uh, version, even uh, not including the, the conversation with, uh, with the uh, brokers or the yeah. marketers. Why did you decide so? Because uh, as you know, Andy actually uh, took photos and she also took uh, videos. So, uh, how, like, did you think about these methods? Uh, yeah, I think I was viewing property for at least two or a couple of years, but just when I moved to London, but just kind of out of interest. I was like, I want to do something with this, but I don't know what. I think at one point I, like, took an actor with me and had written a script for him and thought I was going to make some film of us. I don't know, yeah of us like I was going to film him and that would be a work but um it wasn't that easy to film I mean <laughs> maybe it, there would be a way but also no I think I decided I didn't really want to I mean I take photos when I'm in these places but mm -hmm. I don't really use them as part of the asset arresting unless like just maybe one image for the podcast but no, I, I I was interested in just using language and conversation as a way to create this other image of the space. Um, because, I mean, the images are so abundant here, you know, the, the like hoardings and the posters and everything of these luxury developments. Um, it felt important to kind of use a different medium to make a very different picture of them. Um, and yeah, conversations felt kind of a way that I could do that, but also like talk about other things with people. Um, so I don't know, I think it took me a few years to get to the point where I was like, oh, I'm going to make it a podcast. Um, uh, but I mean, I still see it as like somehow, you know, like it's an artwork, it's a performance, it's a lot of different things. Um, I also collect all the brochures from the places, mostly in London, they have these crazy brochures, but um, so I think it's also a kind of like an archive of it and a way of mapping out these changes um, and conversation to me feels like quite a, I don't know, a valuable way to do that. Cool. I, I, I didn't want to say it's inappropriate. I was just wondering how to think about it. <laughs> oh, also... I don't want to record the audio of the estate agent because, well, I don't, first of all, don't want to get sued. Second of all, um, I feel a bit bad because they're, you know, they're just doing their job. Some of them make a lot of money, a lot of commission, but some of them don't. Some of them work for shitty property developers and probably don't even get paid that well. So I'm not, I don't want to attack them. I'm not attacking them. I, you know, do your job it's more about the the wider system um and also they don't they actually don't say anything that interesting like it's always the same <laughs> yeah and they said so as well yeah well yeah but in new york um it sounds like 
they're a bit more theatrical. Yeah, from what Andy said, compared to here, like I guess, you know, we have the uptight British people or whatever. But I don't know. <laughs> in New York, it sounded more fun from what Andy said. <laughs> Are you planning to visit New York? Uh, one day I would like to go. I mean, I yeah, I'd like to view some property there. Um, yeah, I'm just going to view property wherever I end up going. And hopefully one day with Andy. Cool. And um, reminding everyone can ask, uh, I was advised to keep a, a, a silence for a while to give space uh, if anyone wants to ask. Um, I have some comments. Hi. Things to say. First of all, I think that um, this post podcast is a format for what Laura is doing is, or I at least really enjoy it because it feels like that they speak before going in the property. So they tell you how they imagine it. Then you have this like room for yourself for imagination of like how is it going to be and then they come out and explain it so the whole thing kind of like it's it's like I, to me it's the difference between when you read a child a fairy tale and he has to like imagine everything that's that's actually <laughs> happening image wise or sees a i don't know a fairy tale on the tv so i think it's really nice that like everything is left for your imagination based on their verbal description so yeah that for this and then um i wanted to ask you about that community living thing you <laughs> said that you lived there a month i spent a month there um was yeah. it like part of your research or you just like happened to no no god i didn't no. just like happen to end up okay, okay. <laughs> i couldn't afford to stay there normally no it was part of my phd research uh -huh. so i managed to get some funding for the universe from the university but I was um yeah doing research but also I made a film there um yeah, yeah. I'm so curious about your experience of living there I it was like when was it it was May it was May and we were just out of um lockdown uh -huh. like some things were open kind of but I think you couldn't like have a drink indoors or whatever okay. um so I was really excited because I'd just been in the house for months. So I was like, this is a holiday. Yes. <laughs> it's like half an hour away, but it's a holiday yes. and there's a swimming pool. And like for a week, I was like, this is great. I'm moving in. There's a gym downstairs. Uh -huh. There's a pool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I was like, oh my God, like I, I can't deal with this. I was, I yeah. just got really depressed. I mean, the room is like tiny, tiny, but also just like, I mean, not any smaller than a small bedroom but yes, it's yes. you know got a kitchen and a bathroom shoved in and uh -huh. you've yeah. got house like cleaning staff in the corridor every day and it just felt like a it was like a hotel a nice hotel but I don't understand how anyone can feel comfortable living there but I did speak to people living there obviously and how long are people living in these places well the maximum contract you can sign is a year uh -huh. but you can renew it after that obviously but I can't I don't know I Was can't imagine there anyone who's like living there for I don't know yeah apparently there's well I read about one guy who'd lived there like five years in the in their other building <laughs> uh -huh. well, okay. I mean I've, I don't know I I uh, think I'm just not like uh -huh. sociable enough you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> like and, and I just want to come people, home and like enjoy it or I, I don't know yeah people enjoyed it people enjoyed it so it's like, so kind of have a right audience yeah I mean I some uh like at the weekends people would be having beers in some of the spaces so I would like have a beer and join them and yeah. I even spoke to people who were like estate agents or like <laughs> city planners yes, and they right. they loved living there living so there. but you can stay there it's a hotel as well <laughs> oh, okay. cool okay it's in so London was part yeah. of your research talking with the people and uh finding out uh fight finding out about their like why did they move in and whether they like it or whether they live there from the because of the precarious conditions they were are working in uh not in a formal way just in an informal like I'm gonna chat to people but not in like the way that I guess like an anthropologist would be like yeah, yeah. can you sign this disclosure yeah. and I'll <laughs> interview you yeah more just like okay um I also felt 
like I would be uncomfortable doing that because this is people's home yeah and as much as it didn't feel like a home I was like I don't want to be here as like a researcher kind of I don't know yeah it felt weird to me but I guess that's what like anthropologists do isn't it yeah (laughs) and I think that's the advantage of art is that they can kind of do whatever they want to (laughs) (laughs) yeah advantage but also disadvantage maybe (laughs) <laughs> uh, actually uh, I, I was also curious uh, most of the episodes you did uh, for the asset arrest are examples of um, uh, let's say problematic or controver- controversial development did you consider to I don't know include there uh, the ha- house their statistic uh, because as a, as a positive example or like to maybe uh, bring it further and start or like what are the uh, conditions or on uh, what uh, conditions you choose the property you want to visit and include it uh, in the asset first? Um, I guess it's different. Sometimes if there's a like a guest, either I invite a guest or they ask me if they can do a viewing with me. Um, so sometimes it's like somewhere they want to see. Um, but it's mostly been in the kind of like, luxury crazy end because that's that's where most people are interested in actually getting into (laughs) and (laughs) I mean I would yeah definitely do like episodes around other more positive places um but I guess that's just a very different thing because it's not about uh, yeah I'm interested in kind of accessing these spaces I shouldn't be in or don't feel mm-hmm. comfortable in. Yeah, of course. Anyone? I was told <laughs> that this this silence might be embarrassing. So no, sorry, not embarrassing, but like and we need to give space to people who might be uh, shy. <laughs> we are really we, we really want to like encourage everyone to join but uh did don't you don't be shy don't be don't shy. be shy we are only few uh and it's almost christmas time so <laughs> we can have a glass of wine or something but uh what well, how do you uh, perceive it now after man, like some of the years you are working on the project uh, do you have any feedback or do you think that you contributed to some change or do you have any bad experience that someone found about you and like um, was not very nice that uh, you wanted to access uh, some of the development um, the only person that's actually told me they found out about it was uh, an estate agent in Berlin after I viewed like a, a property there um, and he was very angry uh, <laughs> but I think he accused me of he accused me of it being fraud and yeah I think he was mostly worried that I'd recorded him or something and was going to publish it so um so I didn't feel too bad because I didn't record him in any way I mean it's probably not a nice thing for anyone to discover but it's not like the podcast has (laughs) <laughs> that many listeners that it really matters <laughs> so uh, do you have also any feedback from maybe the professional scene from other artists or people like of course you you you, you got some collaborations you invited uh, invite the guests so you, they probably know the podcast or they got to know the podcast uh once you um uh message them or like email them so what like did you what kind of feedback did you get to your project uh from the people that actually come to the viewings with me yeah or like yeah let's say those um I'm not sure I've had I've not been with anyone to viewing where I've like no one's told me that they're really like uncomfortable with the situation. Um, I've definitely enjoyed it being a way that I can actually just contact people I don't know and be like, 
do you want to meet up and um, go and view this flat? Because, you, yeah, I'd say most of the time it's me contacting someone I don't know and inviting them. And that is like a, a nice situation because you suddenly you're like you have to act like you're a couple or, you know, you're uh, like related in some way. So it's this weird like intimacy that has to be forced um, when you've actually never met before. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I've met a lot of really great people through it and um yeah some of them i'd love if if we did more viewings and stuff together or yeah but i yeah i don't <laughs> i don't know at least with andy i hear the uh, the episode uh when you were pretending you are i think you were pretend, pretending you are a couple right with the kid if I yeah but we well. weren't even in the same place it was it was this kind of uh uh andy was in hong kong and i was in london <laughs> <laughs> cool but we're gonna yeah meet in real life one day <laughs> cool real life sorry that's a this is real life <laughs> anyone any questions Okay, I have one more comment and then I, I have to warn the others if you are still um, hesitating to ask, we will close this session soon. But um, I, I know about one artist, I think she's graphic designer actually, from Bratislava, the Slovak capital. Uh, she does kind of a research project about the language of developers where she also tries to study like uh, what kind of images they use to, to show um, like uh, what actually the, the developers or uh, the marketing uh, of the development pretends to, to be, that uh, the renderings are false, that they are showing, uh, I don't know, um, places full of happy people uh, with kids and so on. And in the end, in the end many of the developments are empty. They are less green uh, and so on. <laughs> uh, so I actually liked uh, liked it, and uh, I, I wanted to invite her for lecture as well. But she said it's a long time ago, ago and she doesn't uh, work on the research anymore. But um, I think I think it was really interesting to study this marketing, and of course, or I I, I have a friend, uh, an architect who studied in in the Great Britain. Uh, in London, I think, and uh, she uh, at the university she has a she had a course of kind of making branding for architecture projects or storytelling. They even were uh, used the word storytelling, so they learned how to uh, promote uh, the development. So she now she doesn't uh, she doesn't only work as an architect, but she also designs um, like branding campaigns uh, for uh, certain developers. And I thought that's that's great that, that it like it has certain rules or like something which you can taught someone but then there should be someone who uh, looks at this uh, at this at, from the critical point of view and summarize it somewhere and give it to the public and show like hey this is what the developers use so actually i don't know i think someone should <laughs> take this challenge and do it yeah i mean that's yeah very much what's happening here and it's usually to do with like culture and artists and using that to construct this narrative um and i yeah i mean the branding of like some of the kind of bigger new developments are basically like oh hey guys this wasn't a place before nothing was here before we've suddenly like magic this out of dust and it's like Mm, there was people here before there were things here before like there's always this desire to kind of reduce everything to zero so they can just create their own narrative completely and I yeah I can't imagine them um, doing that job <laughs> but when yeah I went to one of my most recent asset arrests was at this event it was very businessy and property developers but it was about like uh cultural placemaking and 
after the talk, I asked like a really annoying question to the director of this property developer and he um, and I, actually I was surprised like a bunch of people came up to me after and were like oh thank you for asking that I work for like a place making company and blah 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 and it's you know there's so much shit and yeah I was kind of surprised that people working in this industry were actually like acknowledging that it wasn't great um, but that's just a few people I don't know no I think it might be really interesting that uh, like working for this kind of um, firm doing the placemaking that um, you can honestly believe you are doing something good because <laughs> you are trying to prepare the area or something for the like to be maybe at least accepted better from the neighbors but still for the neighbors you are part of the project or for part of the developers so I think it, it's very complicated position for the people yeah and I mean mostly my biggest issue is with this idea of like community becoming a thing that's sold like this false idea of community when actually oh there's already a community there who are seeing no benefit from this um but yeah communities become like a kind of product an illusion and a product that's just um stuck onto all these developments Yes. Any more questions? <laughs> Hi. Oh. <laughs> Cute. Hi. Sorry. Bon <laughs> appetit. He wanted to see you. <laughs> oh. He's very cute. Good. Then I'll thank uh, you, Laura, for joining us tonight. Also, Andy, thank you for joining us. And uh, I'm curious about uh, your next projects or episode or whatever. And uh, thanks also everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, this uh, lecture will be actually uploaded on YouTube if you want to check it later or something uh, on the YouTube of the Faculty of Architecture. Good. Thanks. Thank uh, you. And have Thank a good you evening. for the invite. And... <laughs> Hi, Andy. Again. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> Enjoy the holidays. I'll see you in a penthouse. Um, yeah. <laughs> sure. Awesome. Bye. Bye.